different setting than what we usually have on Sabbath morning. But I'm just happy that you're joining us today and I'm able to share with you as we celebrate this Sabbath together. Again, not together in physical space, but together with our hearts. And on this Sabbath, that's the closest to Easter. I'm so glad to tell you about what a friend we have in Jesus. Many years ago when Candace and I were living in Philadelphia, I remember it was about the Easter season, driving by an old stone church in a very nice section of Philadelphia. It was a, a stone church that was probably about 100 years old, stately with a huge steeple. Around the outside was a wrought iron fence. Very, very impressive and imposing. Almost, dare I say it, stuffy looking. But outside it had a sign on it that said, one of those removable type signs, that had the message, He is not here. There were no quotation marks to show that it was a quote from Matthew 20, 28, verse 6. And I just thought to myself, it struck me funny, he is not here. If that were true of my church, I certainly wouldn't advertise it on the sign out front. But you know, of course, that they were quoting Matthew 28, 6. The words of the angel at the tomb that Jesus was not there. He is not here. Now for us looking at it from 2,000 years later, we understand that that was good news. But for the disciples and for Mary coming to the tomb, it was not good news. It was sad. Where had they taken him? He is not here. The whole weekend for Jesus' followers had been painful. The whole weekend had been sorrowful. On Friday, they had seen Jesus taken by the Roman soldiers. They had seen him nailed on a cross. They had seen and heard his agony. I can't imagine how his mother must have felt at the foot of that cross, looking up at her beloved son. And then when he had cried out, it is finished, and he breathed his last breath, their hearts were crushed. They had taken his body down and had put it into a tomb which no one else had ever been put into. And then scripture tells us they went and rested according to the commandment. And Jesus also rested in the tomb that Sabbath day. You can read how the four accounts put it. It's all in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all contain the account of this weekend. It sometimes is a little bit uh, difficult to sort out how all of them fit together. And so I recommend to you that over the next couple days, you go to the book Desire of Ages and read chapters 80 through 83. And it helps dovetail all of the events together. But then, finally, Sunday arrives. And Matthew 28, verse 1, tells us what transpired on Sunday morning. Matthew 28, starting with verse 1. It says, Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. It's Sunday morning. Mary and the other Mary go to the tomb, and it says, Behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, to the women, 
Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. What if the angel had stopped there? What if that's all he had said? We would be hopeless. Perhaps someone did steal his body away. You know, that's the danger of reading only half a text, and sometimes we do that. But the danger of reading only half the text. Just think what Romans 6.23 would be like if you read only half the text. For the wages of sin is death. Sounds pretty hopeless. But it finishes. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, when you read the rest of the text, it makes all the difference in the world. He is not here, for he is risen. It makes all the difference, for he is risen. Think of the sadness that must have been on Mary's face. And then suddenly she hears the words, He is risen. He is not here. Oh, how, the, how the, the news of the risen Lord must have changed her thinking. Although, was it too good to be true? Would an angel lie? I don't think so. But was it too good to be true? He is risen. No one could ever say again, because Jesus is risen, no one could ever say again on earth, He is not here. Because... He is risen. He is here. You know, this, this idea of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus became the foundation stone of the early church. And it's the foundation stone of all of our faith. I think it's interesting to go to the very first sermon that's preached after the resurrection. It's on the day of Pentecost. It's 50 days later about Jesus had been with his disciples for 40 days, and then uh, he, he left them. He ascended to heaven, and 10 days later, they're all gathered in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. And remember, the Holy Spirit falls upon them, and they go out and begin preaching in tongues. And Peter preaches this sermon, and it's recorded in Acts chapter 2. And it's interesting to see the, the, the crux, the very middle the most important point of Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. We start reading in Acts chapter 2, verse 22. It says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. At the very beginning of Peter's Pentecost sermon, he points them to Jesus and he talks about the events of the, the death, the burial, and the, the, the resurrection of Jesus as being the, the whole basis of the gospel. And when people heard this, they said, what, was, what must we do to be saved? Their hearts were, were, were uh, pricked and they became repentant of what they had been a part of. And so the, the, the good news of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection was the basis of the first sermon ever preached after the resurrection had happened. This is the good news of Easter. This is why we even celebrate Easter, because the foundation of the Christian message is that Jesus died for your sins. He rested in the tomb over Sabbath, and he was raised again, victorious forever. It's interesting to me that Paul also feels this way in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul is preaching about the gospel. And he says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. 
He says, now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So what's Paul's topic? Paul's topic is the gospel, which means the good news. He says, I'm going to tell you about the good news. I'm going to tell you the gospel. And then he continues on in verse 3 and says this, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Here's the gospel, that Jesus died in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried and raised on the third day. You know, some people try to define the gospel in other ways, but this is the gospel, pure and simple. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but might have everlasting life. This is the gospel. You can't add anything to it, and you dare not subtract anything from it. Because it is, this, it is the good news that saves you and me. Paul had already said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. Earlier in his book to the Corinthians, he'd said, When I came to you, I determined to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now in uh, chapter 15, verse 1, there is an interesting, I'm sorry, in verse 3, there is an interesting phrase here. It says, for I delivered to you as of first importance. The word that's translated there from the Greek, first importance, in most translations, uh, is the Greek word protos, from which we might get the word uh, prototype, or proton, like a building block of all matter, a proton, the word protos. So it is like the first and the most important part, Paul says, the first important is that Jesus died, was buried, and resurrected. And if we believe this, then we understand the gospel that will save us. Paul continues in 1 Corinthians 15 to tell us why the resurrection is so important. And tomorrow morning about at, at 10 o'clock, I plan to, to uh, put a video on Facebook that expounds a little bit more on 1 Corinthians 15 and why the resurrection is so important. But if you read the rest of 1 Corinthians 15, you find that if we don't have the resurrection, we lose hope. If there is no resurrection of the dead, if that would mean Jesus is not raised from the dead, then we have no salvation. And furthermore, the worst part is that if there is no resurrection of the dead, you know, all those people that we've loved, all those people that have died in love with Jesus, Paul says, all of them are still dead. There is no hope for them. We will never see them again. That's why the resurrection is so important. As a matter of fact, Paul says if the resurrection didn't really happen, then in verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 15, he says this. He says, If in Christ... We have hope in this life only. In other words, if there's no resurrection, if, 
if believing in Jesus only affects this life, he says, if it's only in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. If Jesus did not raise from the dead, our faith is hopeless. We are pathetic, pitiful people. But then he continues on. He, he changes the mood in, in verse 20. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, he says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He says, let's nip this in the bud. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead as the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now unpack what that means for just a second. What are the first fruits? The first fruits are the first fruits that come on the tree. And when you see this nice fruit coming on the tree at the very beginning, it holds the promise of more fruit. And, G and Paul is saying that Jesus is the first fruit of the dead, those who are risen. And because he was raised from the dead, there will be another great harvest of those who will come after him. You know, I think of many people I placed in the tomb, in the grave. I think of my mother I placed in the tomb. I get to see her again because of the resurrection of Jesus. He was the first fruits. And so we have this hope. And because the angel could say, he is not here at the tomb, meaning he's been resurrected. Because he was not there in the tomb, I have good news for you today. He is here. He is here. Because he was not there in the tomb, he is here because he has been raised from the dead. What good news. He is here. Our future hope is not based upon some theological idea that somebody might cook up, some new theological understanding that some preacher might preach on YouTube. But our hope for the future is based upon the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead and our future hope is based on the past facts and nothing can ever change that. Here are some promises. He is here. He is here. During this time of social distancing and a time when we're not able to see each other, sometimes it can begin to feel a little bit lonely. But here's this promise. Because he was not in the tomb, he is here. The resurrected Christ is here in my home as I preach this Sabbath morning message to you. He is in your home as you're watching this via YouTube or via Facebook. He is here with us. Jesus promised in Matthew 28, 20, he says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Many people love this promise of Matthew 18, verse 20, in which, he, which Jesus says, For two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now, that's a great text. It seems like we oftentimes quote that when we're having a church meeting and not, not as many people show up as we think they ought to. But it's really true in our homes here right now. Where two or three are gathered, he is there in the midst of them. It's a good promise. It's great. He is here. But I've thought, what about those times I'm alone? If it takes two or three to get his presence, what about when I'm alone? Doesn't he come to be with me too? Here's this further wonderful promise in John chapter 14, verse 18. John chapter 14. Verse 18, Jesus says this, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Now the word orphans means being alone. I will not leave you as orphans. 
I will come to you. So where two or three are gathered, he is there in the midst of them. Where one is gathered, calling upon the name of God, he is here with us, with you. Perhaps you're watching from home right now and you're all alone, but you're not because he is there with you. Here's the good news that I want you to remember on this Sabbath day, the closest to Easter. Because he was not there in the tomb, but resurrected from the dead. He is here with us today. Such good news. And I hope that you'll find comfort in knowing that Jesus is here with you today. I just invite you to sing the words of this chorus together with me as we close. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Let me pray for you. Dear Father God, thank you so much for giving us Jesus. Jesus, thank you for coming down to this earth and being willing to suffer the indignities, the atrocious indignities of, of the cross. And thank you, Father, that you raised him from the dead and that he lives. He is alive today and he's with us in this spot right now. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would draw close to each person as they watch this video and that you will bind our hearts together. And Lord, that you will save us when Jesus comes again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for being with us today. And God bless you. We'll see you soon. Who knows how long it'll be, but we can hold each other in our hearts until then. Thank you.